Turkey is transforming and developing economic and diplomatic relations with its neighbors, prompting many in the global community to talk of axis shift. The Turkish president has given a candid interview to Euronews on where the country might be heading next. <laughs> Sayın Cumhurbaşkanı, Euronews'e hoş geldiniz. Teşekkür ederim. Turkey is developing and extending its relations in the region and this has led to a flurry of debate in the West. Where is the country heading? Is Turkey turning away from the West? Is it shifting on its axis? There's been a lot of talk about this recently and I'm following it all closely. My view is, as I've always said, that much of it is wrong. Some of these comments have been made intentionally and others out of ignorance. Turkey's aim is very clear. We're working towards the most advanced democratic and economic standards we can, and to improve standards. We've had to change the constitution, but we've also benefited from geopolitical opportunities. We have historical advantages as well. We're looking at a multi-directional policy. You said some comments were made intentionally. What do you mean by that? Before, Turkey's foreign policy was on the wrong foot. Imagine a country that's always had problems with its neighbors. Its trade and economic relations with them are barely operational. This should not be the case. Turkey was like a dead-end street. Now it's more of a crossroads. Look at the level of trade between France and Germany, Canada and the US or any other countries sharing a border. They're all doing well, but Turkey's trade with its neighbors was very poor. We were on the wrong axis. Turkey is settling on the right axis now. During the most recent NATO summit, thanks to your insistence, no specific country was identified as a target for the new missile shield system. But French President Nicolas Sarkozy said we should call a spade a spade, clearly referring to Iran. What do you think about that? First of all, looking beyond the actual statement, our decision was made on moral grounds. NATO, as you know, is a defense network. It's not an assault organization and doesn't target any specific country. This anti-missile system is aimed against any country that has or could develop missile capability. There may be many in the future, and so they would also have to be included under the system's range. That's why our decision was morally driven. A general threat assessment was made, otherwise it would be wrong to single out countries one by one. Imagine if the threat came from another member state. What then do you think about the idea of including countries that are not NATO members, Israel in particular, under this umbrella? That's out of the question. It can never happen because this only concerns NATO members. Israel is not a NATO member. It doesn't even cooperate with NATO. This would be impossible. Let's be clear. I'm saying that Israel cannot use NATO facilities. After the Gaza flotilla incident, could Turkey still be described as a friend and an ally of Israel in the Middle East? Frankly, the flotilla incident changed many things irrevocably. The Israeli army attacked a flotilla carrying humanitarian aid while it was in international waters in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea. And unfortunately, several people were killed. We simply can't forget this. Is Israel's friendship with Turkey over? Absolutely. Israel has lost the friendship of Turkey and of Turkish citizens. Turkey and the West seem to have a different approach to Iran's nuclear activity. The emphasis in the West is on concerns about any potential threat, while Turkey insists on the value of diplomacy. Is there a fundamental difference in the concept of security between the West and Turkey? Yes, 
No, of course, Turkey is likely to be very cautious regarding any issue concerning a neighbor. This is no joke. If there's no diplomacy, the alternative is war. Look what happened in Iraq. Diplomacy failed and that led to war. Who paid the price of that war? The people of Iraq and the country's neighbors, of course. Let's talk about the EU. Negotiations on more than half of the negotiation chapters have stalled and support for EU membership in Turkey has plunged from 70% to around 30%. At this point, do you think EU membership for Turkey is still a realistic aim? For us, joining the European Union is a matter of national concern. We're very committed to it. It goes beyond party politics. It's of strategic importance to us. Moreover, the negotiations kicked off in 2005. Most of the leaders that signed that agreement are still in office, and almost all of them are still alive, so they can be held to their promise. If Turkey ends up not joining the EU, is there a plan B or an alternative project in the pipeline? Turkey doesn't have a plan B. But even when we complete the harmonization process and the Commission says Turkey is ready for membership, it will not be over. Some EU members will hold referendums. We don't know how this will turn out and we also have no idea what the Turkish people will think. Maybe they'll act like the Norwegians. But what we must not do is drag our feet over the negotiations. This would be short-sighted, and there are some who don't have this kind of strategic vision. They focus more on day-to-day, -day, trivial problems. Turkey has taken important steps towards democratization in recent years, like the recent referendum on the constitution. However, the picture is totally different when it comes to press freedom, which is seen as a fundamental building block of democracy. The situation here is not good. Isn't this a bit of a discrepancy? Of course, a free press is one of the main pillars of a democracy. Democracy. It makes a country more transparent and acts as a monitor on the government. In that respect, it's a priority for us, and many improvements have been made. But too many journalists have found themselves in court over what they do. This worries me. I've commissioned a government study, and as I understand it, a change in the law is on the cards.